Good evening, brothers and friends. It is an absolute pleasure to once again be in the company of good and faithful men. Good is having the qualities required for a well-rounded and respectful life in the eyes of God, and faithful as remaining loyal, constant, and steadfast in the pursuit of further light in masonry. It is always It is always a help. It is always a heartwarming feeling to see familiar faces on these meetings, as well as new faces who are joining us for an evening of virtual Masonic education. It is my sincere hope that tonight's education provides you with the enlightening experience that you seek and that you leave encouraged to spread that enlightenment and happiness with others. It is the pleasure and honor of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and the Rubicon Masonic Society to bring us together this evening for what is the ninth part of our 10-part virtual Masonic education series. My name is Brian Evans. I'm the master of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, both of which are located in Lexington, Kentucky. And if you ever find yourself in our neck of the woods, we strongly encourage you to reach us out and visit. With the aid of my co-host this evening, who is also tonight's presenter, Worshipful Brother Dr. John W. Bizak, past master of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and vice chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, we are humble and we are honored to be a small part in your search for Masonic knowledge. Over 350 men have RSVP'd for this 10-part series since we started on May 4th. This year, as a result of the social and Masonic distancing, if my co-hosts, brother, junior warden, and senior warden could help ensure that everyone is muted, I would appreciate it. We continue to hope and pray that everyone is staying healthy and safe during this challenging time. That you are finding happiness in those things that matter most in your life, and that this education tonight brings you a little bit closer to your inner self closer to your Masonic brothers, and most importantly, closer to the great architect of the universe. I will now call this virtual meeting to order, and we will begin with a short video poem called When is a Man a Mason by Joseph Fort Newton. When is a man a Mason by Joseph Fort Newton. A man is a Mason when, when he can look out over the rivers, the hills, and the far horizon with a profound sense of his own littleness in the vast scheme of things, and yet have faith, hope, and courage, which is the root of every virtue. When he knows that down in his heart, every man is as noble, as vile, as divine, as diabolical, and as lonely as himself, and seeks to know, to forgive, and to love his fellow man. When he knows how to sympathize with men in their sorrows, yea, even in their sins, knowing that each man fights a hard fight against many odds. When he has learned how to make friends and to keep them, and above all, how to keep friends with himself. When he loves flowers, can hunt birds without a gun, and feels the thrill of an old forgotten joy when he hears the laugh of a little child. When he can be happy and high-minded amid the meaner drudgeries of life, when star-crowned trees and the glint of sunlight on flowing waters subdue him like the thought of one much loved and long dead. When no voice of distress reaches his ears in vain and no hand seeks his aid without response. When he finds good in every faith that helps any man to lay hold of divine things and sees majestic meanings in life, whatever the name of that faith may be. When he can look into a wayside puddle and see something beyond mud, and into the face of the most forlorn fellow mortal and see something beyond sin. When he knows how to pray, how to love, and how to hope. When he has kept faith with himself, with his fellow man, and with his God, in his hand a sword for evil, in his heart a bit of a song, glad to live, but not afraid to die. Such a man has found the only real secret of masonry, and the one which it is trying to give to all the world.
For the Senior Warden Jeremy Patches of Lexington Lodge Number 1, will you please deliver the opening charge this evening? Worshipful Master, the ways of virtue are beautiful. Knowledge is attained by degrees. Wisdom dwells with contemplation. There we must seek her. Let us then, brethren and friends, apply ourselves with becoming zeal to the practice of the excellent principles inculcated by Freemasonry and the good in our hearts. Let us ever remember that the great objects of our association are the restraint of improper desires and passions, the cultivation of an active benevolence, and the promotion of a correct knowledge of the duties we owe to God, our country, our neighbors, and ourselves. Let us be united and practice with diligence the tenets of Freemasonry and our religious beliefs. Let all private animosities, if any unhappily exist, give place to affection and brotherly love. It is a useless parade to talk of the subjection of irregular passions within this meeting if we permit them to triumph in our interaction with each other. Uniting in the grand design, let us be happy ourselves and endeavor to promote the happiness of others. Let us improve in everything that is good, amiable, and useful. Let the good of Freemasonry and our religious beliefs preside over our assembly and under her intentions. Let us act with poise, dignity, and as gentlemen in our labors to become better men. Thank you, Brother Senior Warden. Brother Chaplain Bob Heater of Lexington Laws Number One, will you please deliver the opening devotion? Worshipful Master, brothers, friends, let us pray that the inspiration that we so need may come from our eternal God, the grand architect of the universe, the maker of all things, judge of all men, he who grants every good and perfect gift. We thank you that Freemasonry is a fellowship. We are grateful for the fraternal union we experience when we gather together as enlightened and observant Masons. Guide us this evening as we seek to conduct our affairs in ways which will, will benefit the spread of Masonic knowledge and light. Thank you for giving inspiration to those who planned and are participating in this evening's Masonic activity. Amen. So mode it be. So mode it be. Thank you, Brother Chapel. Brothers and friends, the agenda this evening is the same as it has always been in the past since we started. In just a moment, I will briefly outline the purpose, protocol, and recommendations of these meetings. We will then proceed directly into our education. Following the presentation, we will have live question and answer session with our presenter. Then we will enjoy a little bit of music to help us reflect on those things for which, which we are all individually and collectively grateful for in our lives. We will then provide an update on our next meeting's presenter and close with final comments. Brothers, the purpose of these meetings are very simple, to bring together Masons of all degrees and men interested in becoming Freemasons in a professional online format that provides thoughtful education, deep discussion, live question and answer, fraternal reflection, and conviviality within the hearts of everyone in our global fraternity. The protocol for these meetings are as follows. As you know, these are not tiled meetings. These are virtual education meetings and are not a substitute for large or regular stated communications. Masons of all degrees anywhere are welcome to attend as long as the lodge they are from is recognized by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. Men who are not Freemasons may also attend as long as they are referred to or vouched for by a fellow Mason who is a member in good standing of a lodge recognized by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. Please be mindful that anything discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees, as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected during this online meeting. There will be no alcohol, no smoking, no food or foul language will be permitted. Attendees will be removed if not following protocol. There will be no discussion of politics or religion at any time. There will be live question and answer discussion period following the presentation during which all are encouraged to participate. If you think of a question during the education presentation, please type your question in the chat area. If you would like to ask your question verbally, please simply raise your hand or type, I would like to ask a question verbally and you will be called upon if time permits. Here are some recommendations that should help ensure that this virtual meeting is enjoyable for all attendees. 
First, if you have not already done so, please type your name and the lodge you are from under your picture or video to identify yourself to others. As we know and sometimes experience, technology is challenging, so please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Please be sure to enable your video camera so that all attendees can see what you look like. Please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Please turn off all other computer programs and try to eliminate all other outside distractions in your environment. Tonight's presenter is one of my absolute best friends inside and outside of Freemason, Dr. John W. Bizak. Dr. Bizak is a 45-year veteran in the field of policing and criminal justice. He served over half of his criminal justice career with the Lexington Police Department. He rose through the ranks, serving most of his career in the Criminal Investigation Bureau, Commander of Special Investigations, Robbery, Homicide, and later the Bureau. He retired in 1996 from assignment in the Office of the Chief of Police. He was appointed by the governor in three consecutive administrations to the position of commissioner of the Department of Criminal Justice Training with the Kentucky Justice Cabinet. He retired with 20 years of service where he directed the responsibilities of the department for the hiring and selection practices of Kentucky police officers, as well as overseeing certified basic and advanced annual training for over 10,000 law enforcement criminal justice officials. Dr. Bizak is the author of 14 books, numerous essays, commentaries, and papers on leadership, criminal investigation, police standards, behavioral organizations, and management. His books and writing include the topic of Freemasonry, which we will hear tonight. He speaks nationwide on a variety of issues about Freemasonry, the criminal justice system, and critical thinking. Worshipful Brother Bizak was elected to two consecutive terms as master of Lexington Lodge No. 1, which is the oldest Masonic Lodge in Kentucky. He is co-founder and coordinated the Masonic History and Study Group and has served eight years as chairman of the Education Committee and coordinated the Structure Degree Class Program. He is currently a member of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky Committee on Education, a fellow and member of the Board of the Masonic Society, he is vice chair and founding member of the Rubicon Masonic Society. He is also a member of the Scottish Rite and the Philanthe Society, Philanthe Society, and Quator Coronetti Correspondent Circle. He was named as fellow in the initial class at William O'Ware Lodge of Research in Covington, where he is also a lifetime member and an honorary member of Sophia Lodge 767 in North Carolina's First Observant Lodge. He is also a member of Fiat Lux Lodge 1717 and Alba Lodge number 222 in Washington, D.C. He sat as regent on the board of Eastern Kentucky University and co-founder and president of the Kentucky Law Enforcement Memorial Foundation. Having served as commissioner on the Commission of Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies and Kentucky Crime Council, Council and various other boards and task forces. He is current member of the board of Ronald McDonald House Charities of the Bluegrass. You can learn more about Worshipful Brother Bizak and enjoy his collection of Masonic works on his website, thecraftsman.org. His presentation this evening is Ode to the Way It Was. Will the external epidemic lead to addressing the internal one? Worshipful Brother Bizak, thank you for being a great friend and everything you do for Freemasonry. Yours. Thank you, Worshipful Master. Good evening, brothers all. Since at least last March, we've witnessed two terms enter our Masonic vocabulary, virtual and Zoom, and they unshyly trickled in very quickly. Masons have been meeting Masons from all over the United States and the world, for that matter, on a weekly basis, usually, and without leaving the comfort of our homes and our offices. And this is remarkable because of the incredible technology required and that we have at our disposal to make that happen. But what makes it more remarkable though, perhaps extraordinary, is that many Masons responded so quickly to this technology that has previously been largely ignored by the fraternity for years. 
Obviously, the pandemic is what catapulted the technology and the platform to the forefront in our craft, but it's not been embraced in all circles of our fraternity. Through this technology, Masons have met other Masons they'd otherwise would likely have never met at all. And men who already knew each other have become more acquainted. One brother recently said that over the past 16 weeks of attending Zoom meetings, he had received more education than he'd received in the past 16 years of attending Lodge. Although the meetings have a level of security and privacy, Masons throughout the country have been rather cautious as they should about what is discussed during these meetings, but they've covered a range of topics. In addition to the announcements and updates, men have learned how other jurisdictions were handling and faring in the face of these pandemic restrictions. Different practices are discussed and how business is conducted in respective lodges. The differences in rules, protocol, ritual, and lectures from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and much more about the factual history of our fraternity, its ups and downs, and exchanges about the state of American Freemasonry today. Since these meetings are not tiled, entered apprentices and fellow crafts have perhaps for the first time in some jurisdictions been invited to participate in meetings where facets of Freemasonry and our fraternity are discussed. And in some cases, men who are merely interested in learning more about Freemasonry, perhaps even becoming a candidate, are vetted and permitted to join these meetings. Now we know these style meetings are not intended to be a substitute for genuine Masonic experience that we seek in our lodges, but under the circumstances when they are appropriately organized and coordinated, what's the downside? The attendance of many of these Zoom meetings offered around the nation each week, we find 30 to 300 or more participating in each meeting. There's been no official count as to how many lodges or Masonic groups have offered and presented Zoom style meetings since March. But one brother again reports he attended four in the United States and three others in New Zealand, England, and Canada in one week. And while this effort keeps us connected, and that's impressive, as is the labor required for the men to put them together. If we talk straight, we know that even the large numbers of these meetings draw are but a nominal fraction of the members, especially when we consider there's reportedly over a million Masons in America alone that could be participating in these meetings. And that should tell us something. Some might even consider that something as, uh, let's say, evidence that the majority of card-carrying Masons are not interested in education opportunities or the technology that can, at the minimum, keep Masons connected in the absence of regular assemblies. There's an interesting side to Masonic Zoom meetings around the country, though, and that comes from watching how they vary in design, a lot like our fraternity, but how they have also evolved over the months as men learn to not only set them up, but to coordinate, present, and actively participate. Attending has offered a glimpse into the homes and offices of other Masons around the world. We learned quickly when using this technology that wearing pants was actually optional. We've also sometimes, by accident, sometimes not, met Masons' dogs, their children, their wives, girlfriends, a few mothers, and see some creative and rather unusual backdrops. And we've smiled and we've heard some express their frustration with the learning curve that comes with this technology, especially when they didn't realize at the time that their camera was on or that their microphone was live as they were expressing those frustrations. But regardless, we've seen men connect through these meetings. We see old friends from other parts of the state, the country, we carry on with at least part of what we came to Freemasonry to do, and that is to receive good and wholesome instruction and enjoy some fraternalism the best we can in this format. This cloud platform, brothers, works for video, voice, content sharing, and chat. It's available across the spectrum of mobile devices, desktops, telephones, and room systems. And in this age when most everyone has or can have access to a computer, a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone, or at least a landline. One thing's for sure, if members of our fraternity have an interest in participating in some form of Masonic gathering, seeks education, knowledge, 
company a good man and to remain connected to his fraternity during this period of isolation. There's been ample invitations and sufficient opportunity to do so. And since such gatherings can be recorded and viewed later, there's hardly an excuse for ignoring them, except, of course, a lack of interest. Now, those who have not bothered attending and participating in the many Masonic virtual meetings around the nation and the world over these past four months has only himself to hold accountable. But we'll get back to that topic. Although the pandemic has unceremoniously altered our lives, shut down our businesses, service, services, our schools, churches, our social internet actions since the, about the end of February, it's yet to be declared officially under control, but we do see our country attempting to phase its way back. As we come back, as we come to the end of June, we see grand jurisdictions beginning to announce steps and guidelines that lodges will be required to follow if they are to resume assemblies. Now, much of what that involves shouldn't be any surprise to anyone. Wearing the mask, the gloves, you no know, handshake, social distancing, of course, a limit on the number of members allowed to attend, no ritual, in many cases, no meal served. And to the chagrin of some, no fish fries or pancake breakfast even. Some jurisdictions have gone so far as to even leave it up to the master of the lodge as to whether or not they'll even return to assembly during this reopening phase. But take solace, brothers. During this period of uncertainty about so many things, when it comes to setting up the policies to reopen Masonic lodges, at least we aren't going to have anybody in Masonry tell us that's the way we've always done it. Make no mistake about it. When it comes to how we reopen what has never been closed this way, we're in virgin territory. And this territory demands the use of common sense and an abundance of no nonsense, authentic leadership to marshal that common sense. And there's a serious issue that arises from this that can no longer be conveniently ignored in Freemasonry. And that issue tells us quite a bit about the current state and condition of our fraternity. And while this issue has lingered in the background for years, it's now moved to the widespread forefront of concern, but only because of this pandemic. The average age of our card-carrying member is reportedly around 67, which is the very population in the category of the highest risk in contracting and experiencing the most difficult recovery from this virus. Now, if we talk straight, we know the majority of the average age group is not necessarily the members who regularly participate, much less attend lodge. But we also know there's a sufficient number of men who are involved in our lodges or who are close to in that specific age group. In a perfect world, we'd see many younger men of a 30s and their 40s, but we're not in that perfect world. If we talk straight about what many refer to as the age problem, and truly understand our factual history, we know that while our philosophies, the principles that make up the doctrine of Freemasonry, are grounded and supported by natural law, and they've proven time and again through the ages to be a laudable pursuit, and that our fraternity has not always lived up to its billing in the way we've attempted to deliver the promise of Freemasonry, or followed its historical intent and designed to keep younger men attracted and interested. That is especially true since 1959. Brothers in masonry, we find developed one of the most fascinating and logical plans of instruction known to man. So we must keep in mind that it is not the doctrine of Freemasonry that is at risk of changing because of this pandemic. Right worshipful Thomas Jackson has said the philosophy of Freemasonry can never outlive the needs of human existence. And I would add to Tom's statement that we should know, whether we're Masons or not, that which is true and good is never out of date. However, many of our most common methods of teaching the truth in our fraternity may be way out of sync today. There's never been a Mason with an ounce of sense who suggests our philosophies need to change but there's been multitudes of Masons, scholars, observers, and leaders in our fraternity in the past and today 
who have suggested and strongly urged since 1779 that we pay closer attention to how we deliver what we say we came to Freemasonry to do. If we talk straight, and again, if we have a grasp of our factual history, we know the greatest risk facing Freemasonry today is the long standing, deeply embedded, miscalculated notion that we can effectively measure the success of our fraternity by counting the number of names on our membership roster. We've always been in a hurry to get more members. And if we talk straight about that, perhaps we'd recognize one reason that continues is that we don't seem to be able to retain the majority that we admit. There's reasons for that too, brothers, and our fraternity as a whole cannot wash their hands of the responsibility for it. If we continue to talk straight, and we have a grasp of that factual history, we can easily see how pursuing that adventurous notion of always pushing for more members since the 19th century has sacrificed our exceptionalism, our purpose. It's led to lowering our standards of qualifications it attract, to attract more candidates. It's made it easier to join the fraternity. It's led to rushing men through our degrees, casualizing our practices and our protocols. It's weakened the understanding of our historical aim and intent as an organization. And while all those things may have come from well-intended leaders and approved by the majority of well-intended members, they have not proven to constructively advance and ensure the perpetuity of the organization we're in today. As we move into the month of July, we're approaching the reopening phase around much of the nation and certainly with our Masonic assemblies. And we all hope that every Mason will strive to marshal the common sense to do the responsible things we should do to make meeting possible again, at least for the time being, and to best ensure the safety and continued health of our members. It seems that this is also a very appropriate time for us to recognize that at least some organizational introspection about what we do as a fraternity would be quite helpful. Now, we'd all like to think that for the past 16 weeks or so, social distancing and this isolation, that Masons have used their time constructively and wisely, just as we're instructed to do by the lessons of the 24-inch gauge, and that during this pause in our fraternity, that Masons have made a daily advancement in their Masonic knowledge. And as I said, I th we'd like to think that. Now, if that has been the case, perhaps many have discovered through their reading and self-study that if they didn't realize it already, that our pool of prospective qualified candidates in the future is as small as the steady decline of our membership over the past 61 years is large. And because of that, we should see the folly of trying to measure the effectiveness and success of Freemasonry by the number of names on our membership roster. It should also make clear that the principles and philosophies upon which our institution was founded and based grew out of the age of reason and the enlightenment period. And those profound principles and philosophies have slowly eroded, and we see them replaced by a population in which there is an observable loss of reason, logic, a lessening of faith, tolerance, spirituality, critical thinking, and the discounting of scientific proofs and natural law. If we talk straight, we know our culture today is affected by a population that does not always encourage or consider that it is still a laudable pursuit to gain real knowledge. There's a growing population where opinions and feelings are freely substituted for fact. And worse yet, opinions and feelings seem to, at times, carry more weight than facts with the way too many think. And as a result, that shapes the mindset that increasingly separate us from the functional understanding of our factual history. Brothers, that's the internal epidemic in our nation's society today. And if we talk straight, and we know we can find a lot of that within the ranks of our fraternity as well, because the ranks of our fraternity are made up of that population. If we look at the tumultuous 1960s, we can see how this internal epidemic began to manifest publicly. We can read, see films, look at our education system and watch our televisions today and see in real time how it continues to spread. And what a paradox that is. Because for 300 years, Freemasonry has proven to be the sound solution for much of what ails our society. 
yet it is today less known in its existence than ever before. As past Grand Master of Indiana, Dwight Smith repeatedly told Masons in the 1960s, learning and practicing Freemasonry is also a remedy for what ails most of the fraternity. Brothers, when we consider the findings of a recent Masonic survey that tells us 56% of all men who are currently on the rolls have never meaningly participated in the activities of their lives since having received their most recent degree, we should take heed. Freemasonry is not intended for all men. We know that. It's not intended even for all good men. Becoming a Freemason, not just being made a member by admittance, requires time and genuine commitment to the labor essential in learning, experiencing, and integrating the truths of life and our universe into our personal lives. The mosaic making up all the intricate features of Freemasonry are indeed inevitable. They cannot be learned, much less appreciated, if there is insufficient commitment to do so. If Freemasonry is to mean anything to a man and he to it, he must spend some time with it and give reverence and devotion to this most fascinating and logical plan of instruction ever known to man. Becoming a Freemason, brothers, is not a part-time profession, and Freemasonry is certainly not designed to be a hobby. If we can't communicate and instill that reverence and inspire devotion in our candidates and members, then it's likely because we're not using the methods of delivering the promise of Freemasonry as designed and intended. Over the past 16 weeks, Masons have certainly exercised their position as speculative Masons by expressing their thoughts about what our lodges are going to look like whenever we return to assembly. Here are some of the most common things with which we've heard speculated. We've heard speculation that members will return in groves once our stated meetings and events reopen. We've heard speculation that things will be back to, quote, normal in all respects, unquote by the end of the year. We've heard speculation that members will return, will not return, until there's a vaccine for this virus. We've also heard that families will be the leading cause and the reason members will be discouraged from returning to Lodge for fear of exposure to the virus, no matter the precautions that are taken. We've heard speculation that the fraternity will become even more casual in its practices than ever before. We've heard speculation that we'll be flooded with candidates who, after struggling through months of social isolation, will now somehow discover how Freemasonry is the path they seek to pursue in their lives. And of course, we've heard naysayers speculate that this pandemic has hastened the end of our fraternity. And that's a particular speculative view with which I steadfastly disagree. Amid the speculation, brothers, there's one question we have not heard asked. And that question is, what is it exactly that we want to return to? I sense one reason we don't hear that question is that many simply accept that things will at some point merely return to the way it was in all respects. So let's ask that question in more detail. Do we want to go back to the way things were and just be satisfied that the way things were, was, and will be good enough and that our fraternity will successfully cascade into the future, even though it was not necessarily headed in that direction before the pandemic? Do we want to return to counting names on our membership roster and continue to fuel the belief that such arithmetic serves as the true measurement that defines the success of our organization. We want to get back to Lodge and devote constructive labor to taking stock and what this pause has helped many to reconsider about the way we do business and offer that promise of Freemasonry. Do we want to experience what Hammer calls an intimate gathering of seekers? Or do we want to continue practices resembling those of civic clubs? Do we want to undertake the important labor of supplying to our world men of faith, of courage, of willpower, of intellect and vision, men who serve as examples to their family, friends, and associates in their communities, to also labor toward higher and nobler thoughts and deeds. 
This list could go on. We talk straight, brothers. We know that those who seek more than the way it was before the disruption of this pandemic is a relatively small percentage of our membership. And that's not to say that the average Mason has no interest in seeking more than the way it was. But we know, too, from the track record of our factual history that most often what the majority seek is usually more of what they already have. Do you think there's ever been or do you think there will ever be an altruistic, cross-sovereign, multi-jurisdictional, truly collective movement pursuing the laudable purpose of organizational introspection that will take place soon in American Freemasonry? Well, again, if we talk straight, we can safely say that it probably will not take place, at least anytime soon. But no matter, that doesn't prevent you and others of like mind to seek more than the way it was to pursue Freemasonry the way you seek to experience it. And as we move into the new decade of the 21st century, there's no better time to ponder these questions. Now, in conclusion, if we continue to talk straight, I sense we'd find there are men here in this room with us tonight who've already pondered the question of what exactly do we want to come back to? I sincerely hope, and I'm sure that you join me, that men who do go back will find what they seek from the membership in this honorable institution, whatever that might be. If there's anything constructive in the result of this pause, other than hopefully helpfully to disrupt the spread of this virus, it's likely to be the discovery, as it were, of the new value we've found in the technology platform we are on right now. Now, for those who use this sort of technology every day in their business, please remember that masonry was slow to adapt fax machines and later the internet. So what's been done through the introduction of this technology that gives us this meeting tonight is an enormous step for masonry brothers. We can get a lot from the technology that we can't replicate or replace the powerful sense of worthwhile from seeing and or being part of a well-orchestrated and proficiently performed ritual and ceremony or create that, that special sense of satisfaction we get that sticks with us on the drive home after a lodge meeting or a Masonic event that tells us it was worth every effort and minute of our time and fuels that spirit of being happy to meet, sorry to part and happy to meet again. But we do have another tool now. It's not a panacea, nor will it be the fulcrum on which all of American Freemasonry will pivot direction and charge down a new path into the future. Regardless, the technology offers men of all degrees of voice. It allows more men to travel, at least virtually, to any other Masonic lodge in the world that takes advantage of this technology for the express purpose of spreading light through education, constructively offering perspectives, and the much needed introspection of our fraternity and that long list of things that need to be addressed in a sensible way for the good of our order. Now, in addition, it has added a new way to hold officers meetings, planning sessions, committee work, at times when physical meetings are not practical or possible. And importantly, any lodge that pursues the use of this technology can have, if they wish, speakers on topics of interest from anywhere in the world to join them at little or no cost, like travel and other expenses to their lodge. If what has been advanced in the way of technology during this pandemic period were to fall by the wayside, brothers, in favor of exclusive return to the way it was, then doing so and seeing the advancements just over the past 16 weeks will become one more thing to add to a long list of squandered opportunities we find in our factual history. If we want to spread light and Freemasonry, brothers, the past months have proven we have another useful tool through which to take advantage. And that contributes what we all have declared we came to Freemasonry to do. Brothers, it's always a pleasure to be in the company of good men, whether it's in person or virtually. And I appreciate your attendance this evening and attention to my comments. I wish you and your families continued health and my warm paternal regards. Thank you. Thank you, Worship Brother Bizak. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. So, 
since the first time that I met you, I was intrigued. You were unique and you always told it straight. So my question to you is you use the term straight talk many times in your presentation. Why do we as a fraternity, maybe even a society, outside of the fraternity, as a people, human beings as a whole, if you want, why do we avoid straight talk when that's exactly what we should be doing? We need more straight talk in our lodges, but why, why does it get avoided? Why do we not do it? Well, there may be some uh, confusion about the difference between straight talk and our, our uh, need to feel Masonic and tolerant and polite uh, and stay in harmony. And that all applies, no question about it, but there's a balance to that. And if we sacrifice straight talk, as it were, or just authentic leadership in favor of let's just everybody get along, let's everybody try to be pleased, let's try to make everybody happy at once, it just can't happen, even in an organization like Freemasonry. It's never happened in any organization in the world. The concept is to ensure that what the majority of the organization seeks, they find. I don't know how you can do that other than just be straight with people. And if we are really Masons and we really do adhere to our principles, there won't be disharmony. There'll be understanding and we'll move forward. Right. Why do you think most men pursue Freemasonry at the very beginning? Is it the ring? Is it family heritage? Is it education? Is it brotherhood? Is it entertainment? Is it a beer? Why do you think most people are attracted to Freemasonry? I think it's, a, I think it's all of those things. And our, uh, throughout our history, we've seen that's changed a little bit. Uh, it used to be quite vogue to be part of the Masonic society. It was almost necessary and essential if you were going to get ahead in society in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. Uh, it still has that to some degree, but it's kind of been a loss since the 60s, uh, specifically uh, the 50s. Um, I think we could probably say if there's a million men in Mason, Masonry, there's a million reasons men came to Masonry. But I think essentially men are looking for some type of uh, association with like-minded men. And if they don't find that, or their definition of what they want to see is like-minded, they won't stick around. We've seen that happen since 1959. What we have done is not present what men were looking for. And we can't hold ourselves unaccountable for that. Although we take a lot of uh, uh, narrative directions in saying that, well, it was the Vietnam War. If we lost a generation, uh, men are busier today than they were 300 years ago. Well, I would challenge every one of those. And there's evidence to show that's not the only reason Freemasonry has lost its members. We failed to be as introspective as we should be, as organizations must be, to see if we're doing things correctly too. We can't say we're not at fault. When did you become a Freemason, John? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Brian. When did you become an initiated Freemason? Uh, well, I was initiated in 2010. I, li I like to steal Cameron Poe's uh, response when he's asked about um, when he became a Freemason. Uh, I think Cameron, Cameron, if you're on here, you can correct me, but I think Cameron says, I've always been a Freemason. And I think many men in the fraternity would find that's a true answer because what you find when you get to the fraternity, if you do value and appreciate learning and you see what the principles of the, of the fraternity is, is it's, they're reaffirmations. They confirm for you that if you've been a good man in your life, you're doing it right. And here's the philosophy in the organization that affirms that. Just keep doing it. Polish it. Get better. So what made you want to finally petition? I sh I'm assuming you did your research and you had a good understanding of what you were getting into. What was it that made you finally petition to become a Freemason? Uh, well, I, I've said before, I've kind of read my way into masonry. I read about it long before um, I petitioned to lodge, but I was at a point in my life where I was able to devote the time I thought it would take. And 
I looked at several lodges and I was fortunate enough to be in a business that allowed me to travel around the country and I knew several Masons and I gauged from my reading and from knowing them what I thought I was looking for. And I found a lodge in Lexington, number one, that I wanted to become a member and I started there. And I'll say that I didn't find everything I was looking for at number one, but over the years, the many men who were looking for something that was very similar to what I was looking for changed the culture of this lodge. And it's turned into something that I was certainly looking for, and I believe many of our members were too. From my research of number one and understanding of it, you and Cameron and a handful of other past masters played a very pivotal role in the direction that we are going now and will hopefully continue to go in the future. What advice would you give to other lodges from a leadership perspective on how to, if they choose to, build a better lodge? from where it is now to where they want to take it? What advice would you give from a leadership perspective? Well, another perspective is that I wouldn't give any advice to any lodge, frankly, because I think every lodge does what the majority of their lodge wants to do. And we have never in the past held up what we do at number one as the example of what you must do or should do or have to do. And I think that's the right approach in masonry. Now, if somebody wants an example of what we do, they should come and visit. They should see what we do. They should have that experience. If it's um, suitable for them and they want to do it in their lodge, it isn't going to happen overnight. It took us 10 years to change the culture of our lodge. And there's other lodges in the United States who've done the same thing. It takes time. And my advice would be be patient and ensure that there is a collective group of like-minded men who have the commitment and willingness to endure the time it takes to make your lodge what you seek it to be. But as far as exactly what that is, um, as I think everybody in this room knows, it's, it's something different to most everybody, at least in the way we perform our practices and the way that we deliver what we consider to be the promise of the craft. Which Brother Bizak, we have a comment, actually, and I think I'd just like you to elaborate on the comment from uh, Brother Bedford Jackson. He says, the perfect comment of Brother Bizak this evening was that learning and practicing Freemasonry is the cure to the ailments of Freemasonry. Would you just elaborate on that thought? Yeah, that's a quote from uh, Dwight Smith, who wrote that in the mid-60s. Um, if you haven't read any of Dwight Smith's work, I would encourage you brothers to look it up and find it. Uh, he will still stand today uh, timely in his comments and his perception and his perspectives about Freemasonry. But I think what Smith was talking about and what I was referring to is that when we look a little deeper into what our principles tell us we should be doing and what we should be practicing, therein we find the solution on how to coordinate harmony in lodges, how to ensure we have men who voice what they are seeking and that that majority carries that voice and takes that lodge in the proper direction. I believe that our Masonic principles will allow us to do that. And I think we can find examples of at least 40, maybe 60 lodges in this country that I'm very familiar with who have done just that. They've used the principles of Freemasonry to collectively assemble a group of men who are indeed like-minded about what Freemasonry should be and the experience that they seek. Do you, um, what perspective do you have that compares, and I'm not trying to compare for any reason other than just trying to understand a perspective in your mind of American Freemasonry versus um, overseas Freemasonry, international Freemasonry. How does it, how do the two compare in your well, I think we have the world's foremost expert on here tonight who could answer that question, and Tom Jackson, who is maybe the most well-traveled American Mason in the world. Uh, there's an extreme difference, and we have approached it in a way, and, I, and, I, and Tom, I'm, I'm going to defer this to you in just a second, but I think we have approached Freemasonry from the perspective that 
we were a young nation when British Freemasonry came to this country. And our country evolved with Freemasonry. And we turned Freemasonry into what our country was evolving into and it's followed through the ages like that every period. When it came from Britain, it was already in a well-established culture and it had its own baggage. When it came here, that baggage didn't stick. We kind of turned Freemasonry into what we thought it would be with those core principles. But Tom, please feel free to jump right in and turn your microphone on and talk about Freemasonry in, in Europe and South America and the places you're intimately familiar with what the difference is between what we do here and what they do there. Worship Brother Jackson, you are unmuted and should be free to speak. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the difference between the, the question that was asked is the difference between what we experience in Freemasonry in North America versus in, Euro, in Europe. There's a considerable difference in Freemasonry in North America than everywhere else in the world. Uh, there is no and I've traveled over a great portion of the world, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, the last 20, 25 years. And uh, the major difference that I have found between what uh, we experience in North America versus what is experienced in the rest of the world is what is required to become a Freemason, what is required to remain a Freemason, and what is required to understand and learn Freemasonry. North American Freemasonry has pretty much eliminated all of the intellectual requirements that exist in the rest of the world. In almost every country outside of the United States, it will take you a period, a minimum of a one year to complete your three degrees. In many cases, it will take three, four, five years until you can become a master mason. The cost to become a Freemason in the rest of the world is measured in thousands of dollars, not the hundreds or even less that we require in the United States. Attendance at meetings are required in most of the rest of the world. If you, do, if you miss a meeting or two meetings without a justifiable reason, you're subject to suspension. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, requirement to learn is much more rigid than what we teach in the United States. To become a Freemason in many of the Latin American countries, once you petition a lodge, you will spend a minimum of one year being examined by the lodge to determine whether you're fit to be a Freemason. If you are approved, then you can receive the first degree, and in that period of time, between the first and the second degree, you will have presented a minimum of three learned papers on Freemasonry. Then you will stand an examination on the floor of the lodge. If you pass, you are then eligible to be raised. After raising, you will go through the same process. What the difference is is simply what is required versus what we require. I hope that explains a little bit, uh, that you understand a little bit more about what the rest of the world requires compared to what we require. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Worship Brother Jackson. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, do you have anything else you want to add to that or comment on that? Tom um, always does an excellent job explaining it. No, I, I can't add anything. Worship Brother Jackson, thank you. Um, for those of you that are on, Paying attention tonight, Worship Brother Jackson will be next week's presenter. I encourage you to not miss that presentation. It will be excellent. Worship Brother Jackson, thank you. You're welcome, sir. So we have a couple questions in the chat box, Worship Brother Bizak. Um, one from your good friend, uh, Right Worshipful Michael Stoops. And before his comment, he did have to throw out a, a question if anyone has had any good chocolate cake lately. So um, his question is a good one. Um, he says, will there come a time and point when those within masonry who believe what we are talking about will have to break ranks 
break away from those who just do not understand and do not want to understand what masonry truly is? It's a tough question. Uh, I don't believe there's going to be a rank breaking. Uh, I believe there may be men who seek out other jurisdictions that are closer to their uh, or the experience they want to seek and perhaps lodges in those jurisdictions that offer more in jurisdictions that encourage more. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a break or not, Michael. Um, you and I have talked about that in different ways. I know there's uh, a lot of talk from a lot of Masons and a lot of jurisdictions around the country that think that might be an idea. But again, breaking means also finding another Grand Lodge. And I'm not so sure American Masons in mass uh, will do that. Thank you. We have another question from a brother, Chris Enders. He says, in addition to COVID, there is also the perception publicly of systemic racism, which is receiving much attention. He says, speaking straight, how do you see this impacting masonry moving forward? How is it seen impacting what? Systemic racism. How do you see that impacting Freemasonry moving forward in addition to COVID? Well, brothers, as I said in the presentation, we draw our pool of candidates and members from the larger society. And just because you take an oath, an obligation, and you're given a card saying you're a Mason, it doesn't mean everything you brought to the fraternity is immediately wiped out of your mind. Uh, it takes some work to do that. It takes some work to see things in a different perspective. Uh, if you want to see exactly where we stand on the issue of Prince Hall Masonry, take a look at a map of the jurisdictions that still haven't even recognized Prince Hall Masonry. Uh, I believe I saw John Roark on here this evening, and I think John has had conversations about that on his podcast, and I know he's spoken about that issue in the past. He may want to chime in on that. But, uh, there's, it's not just what racism we may find in our fraternity that is affecting our fraternity. It's not just COVID that's affecting our fraternity. It's the fact that our pool of qualified candidates in the future are not what they've always been in the past or what we thought they were in the past. And guarding the West Gate, as we get to be a smaller fraternity, which we will, is going to be imperative to make sure that qualified men come into this organization, the qualified men who are committed to pursue Freemasonry come into this organization. We didn't get to where we were just in a couple of generations. This has taken multiple generations to bring us to where we are in our perspectives, not only about race, but about what we do as Freemason and even what Freemasonry is anymore. Yeah. If we have an internal epidemic, this is from Worship Brother Kevin Snyder. If we have an internal epidemic to continue with your metaphor, we may or may not be able to find a treatment. But what to you is the vaccine to prevent it from re recurring to our lodges? For example, he says, what do you see as the singular and most important injection, quote unquote, that can immunize our lodges if there is one? I don't think there is one. I think there's a multitude of things. We'll go back to Dwight Smith. Let's practice some Freemasonry. But to practice it, we have to know what it is we're going to practice. That's another one of Tom Jackson's quotes, by the way. We have to know what Freemasonry is. And lodges are going to have to define what they want it to be. And they're going to have to educate. And Kevin, I think you know this from your experience. Education, education, and education comment I made before about a brother saying in 16 weeks, he's heard more about Freemasonry and educated more about the topic than he has in 16 years. What in the world does that tell us about what's going on? I think the antidote, if we want to call it that, or remedy or vaccine is that we collectively have to look at what are we doing and what do we want and define what we want, plan what we want, not just year to year, not from master to master to master, plan years in advance, create a three, four, five year plan, put like-minded men together, 
in positions of leadership. And don't worry about hurting people's feelings. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Obviously, that should be, we should, that should go without saying whether you're a Mason or not. But at the same time, you do have to follow a path. And that path, I believe, brothers, is Freemasonry and applying the principles as such. Yeah, well said. This is an interesting comment. This is really more for those of you in Rubicon um, who attended and came to my house this past weekend where we talked about ways to improve Freemasonry and you know all the fun conversations we have as a small group. Um, we have Worst Brother or Brother Bill Tribbett. He says, would there be a way to set up an online education program to take Master Masons back through the degrees so that he gets a proper Masonic educational experience? So I just wanted to add that I think that's an interesting comment since we were talking exactly about that 24, 48 hours ago and what that might look like. Um, what comments would you give or thoughts on that? Well, I think it'll look a whole lot like what we're doing tonight. And I think there would be a syllabus. I think there'd be a curriculum. It would be for men who are brand new to masonry and wanted more than perhaps they were finding. It might even be for men who've been masons for a while, veteran masons. We are like that man who attended lodge for 16 years and didn't get much. They may want to come on and look at that curriculum. It could be something that meets um, twice a month, once a week. It could be a course to take, not like the courses we see today, not the kind of uh, programs that are uh, around the nation. It would be something different and it would be something that men would have to sign up for. And there's been a lot of encouragement to do that in other parts of the country and there's been marginal success in small pockets. And uh, I think that's an excellent question and another one of those questions that we should be asking ourselves when we talk about what do we want to return to when we go back to our lodges. I agree. <clears throat> I'm gonna mention this comment because it was it was shared publicly with everyone. And, and this is this goes back to um, the conversations on potential racism. So I wanna give my comment first to his response. And if you, Worst Brother Bizak or Worst Brother Jackson or anyone else. Sure. <laughs> So Brother David Felty says, although my father and assorted uncles and cousins were Freemasons, I delayed joining for decades because of my correct perception of widespread racism. I was born in Ashland, Kentucky and did undergrad, undergrad at UK. I only joined after I was told that black and white Freemasons had reconciled. His comment was they lied in the case of Florida, although it is now getting better. Is racism still widespread in Kentucky Freemasonry? He says, I do not wish to be impolite. Just asking a very sincere question. So I want to give my comment first because that's a really difficult question to answer, but this is straight talk. Um, David, I think we have probably all experienced what you're referring to. And I believe the men on this program tonight and a part of this inner circle, if you will, um, are in complete disagreement in that part of Freemasonry. We, and I, if there is any Prince All Brothers that would like to chime in, we welcome you. Freemasonry should bring people together. It should be able to see people, uh, not for what they look like, it look like inside but, or outside, but who they are inside. So the honest answer is, David, yes, it exists, unfortunately, but I believe it's getting better. And hopefully that trend will continue to one point in the future when it will no longer exist. Um, so those are my comments, Worst Brother Bizak. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I agree with what you're saying. And for an organization that teaches what we teach, it's rather discouraging and disappointing to see that we don't practice what we preach. <clears throat> if I might, uh, add something there. Uh, when I was a boy growing up, my best friend was a black boy. We're both 86 years old now, and we still call each other every few days to see how we're doing. I became a Freemason when a Prince Hall Freemason said to me one day, Tom, you should be a Freemason. That was back in 19... Oh, 
59. Without his uh, comment that day, I may never have joined Freemasonry. I gave the eulogy at his Prince Hall funeral service, and I dedicated my first book to his memory. Uh, realistically, and it's difficult, I guess, to remove some ingrained animosities with which you grew up. But there is no room in Freemasonry for racism. Uh, we must simply begin, if that becomes a factor, we have to practice what we preach. Thank you. Thank you, Worship Brother. Well said. David Crickard, one of our own of Lexington Lodge number one, he says, I'm very sad for the state of our country at this moment. And I think where he was going with this comment is what can he and what can we as Freemasons do, if anything, to bring more optimism to the world? Well, David, I, that's a great question. And there's a lot of men I know that want to do something and aside from the uh, relief work that's done around the country to those uh, suffering from and struck the hardest by the pandemic and wanting to find reconciliation with other things going on in the country, I think that one of the strongest things we can do is be collective as a fraternity. And whenever we get back to meeting, whenever if we continue with these type of meetings, whatever we do as Masons, be an example be an example of what it is we think we want to see society be. And I believe serving as an example individually, whether we're in meetings or not, which is what we're supposed to do to begin with, is possibly one of those uh, remedies. But you know, it's, it's a long uphill process because not every man in Freemasonry will do that or does do that even when these things aren't going on. But I think that's what your charge is all about, to behave as a good man and to find a good man through your own beliefs and what you've learned from Freemasonry and be the example. Yeah, exactly. We have another comment, uh, Brother Scott Schwartzberg, Senior Warden of Boynton Lodge number 236 says, um, he was a one-day Mason, and he is now a Lodge mentor, and he would work to ensure that no one else in his Lodge has an experience like his. I'm assuming that's because it was a one-day Mason degree, um, but he just wanted to add that comment. Worship Brother Bizek, you've written a lot of books. The one that is probably my favorite, frankly, is Island Freemasonry, because for me, it's what I needed to hear as a Mason. I needed to hear that you may not, if you're not getting what you want out of Freemasonry, maybe try to find another lodge or find the lodge that is right for you. And I think that that was my main takeaway from your book, Island Freemasonry. If you can't change Freemasonry as a, as a whole, not to say that's what we're out to do, and find a lodge that you can create improvement and growth within. Um, so I wanted to make that comment about your book, Island Freemasonry. Is, would you say that that's on track, and would you add anything else to that? Uh, well, thank you for that comment. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what Freemason, what, what Island Freemasonry uh, makes in one of its many points, is that if you aren't enjoying finding what you're seeking in the lodge you're in or you can't find a lodge to go to keep looking uh, this is supposed to be a journey it's not supposed to stop just because you happen to land in a lodge if it's not the lodge for you go find the one that is and that can go either way you may want to do something more formal you may want something less formal but if it's what helps make you a better man and helps you ingrain the principles of freemasonry go do it but don't do nothing most likely you'll fade away from Freemasonry as we've seen happen around the country if men aren't interested in the work that's offered to them in our craft. From my experience at number one, I think one of the best things that we do have done and continue to do is we talk. 
we talk as officers, we talk as members, and we set goals, and we are constantly trying to improve ourselves. Iron sharpens iron, uh, and that's what's fun. And I think that any brothers that are looking for that, just start opening up conversations and asking questions. And I think they'll get more right information. Even what we're doing right now, we're talking. Uh, that's one of the most important things we can do is communicate as people. As people. Great. That's one of the main things that keeps a relationship together with husband and wife is to communicate. We're not always going to get along. We're not always going to see eye to eye, but by gosh, we should be able to talk without hating each other. <laughs> a little, little, little side, little side. I, would add, I would add too that going back to your earlier question Brian is that we should also be able to talk and disagree and not hold grudges and be mad about it if we are practicing Freemasonry we do that and we respect each other's opinion and we use tolerance in that way Brother, just a couple more questions uh, in the chat box, if you like. We have a question from Bill Tribbett. Brother Bizak, have you ever considered recording an audio version of some of your books? Audible has a great amount of Masonic audio books. Um, actually, one of the books is an audio already, a book called The Reckoning. That's a, a three-part essay. Uh, it was released uh, last year. It's quite long because reading it took a while. Uh, but I didn't read it. It was a professional um, person who read it out in California and produced it there. But uh, no, I haven't considered the others. John, what's your favorite part about Freemasonry? I think um, relating back to something I said earlier is just the sense of reaffirmation that I don't feel I was uh, needing reform. I don't feel I was needing a deeper rudder in my life when I got into Freemasonry. But I've realized the importance of having a deep rudder. And I've realized the importance that Freemasonry affirms and helps me personally keep that rudder deep. And the favorite part of it is that it's there all the time. It's not something I can turn on and off. You either are or you're not, or you are not constantly working to live up to being a Freemason. And I think that's a great challenge for me. We have Brother David Ozvat, past master. He wants to make a comment. So Brother David, I'm going to unmute you so you can make a comment. Thank you, brother. Um, Actually, I'm retired and living in uh, North Carolina I'm from Ohio. I'm a member of uh, Sophia Lodge here in uh, T.O. Lodge here in North Carolina. I became a Mason. I'm a 50-year Mason who was raised in my dad's lodge in 1970. I was a senior at Ohio State at that time. And I looked around at that lodge in 1970, and I said, why is it just a bunch of old white men here? Here I am as a senior at Ohio State. We're going through it. That was the, that was the year of Kent State and all the uh, riots that were going on in the country. It was Vietnam. It was uh, uh, equal rights for our, our brothers, uh, our, our black brothers. and So I became a little jaded. I really didn't get active until um, uh, early 2000s when we did recognize in Ohio, we recognized Pr Prince Hall. And I was living in Columbus at that time. Uh, transferred membership to a lodge there, but I became a member, a founding member of a lodge called Arts and Sciences in, in Columbus. Maybe you've heard of that. It was truly the reflection of what we're talking about here tonight. We have five holy books on the altar, which truly represents every member in our lodge, a Muslim, a Jew, a Jewish person, a, a Hindu, a Shinto, 
um, and of course Christians. So, and we had uh, African Americans, we had true and real, real Africans. I, um, so it was, it was, to me, that was really what we represented. <clears throat> As I listened to Brother Jackson tonight, and what it, ta what it takes to become a member in other countries, I think that's the answer to American masonry. What does it take, in, you know, even in our lodge in uh, Arts and Sciences Columbus, we would eat, we would have a meal before the lodge. And if people are interested, they would have to come to our lodge several months to just to eat, or I mean, to the restaurant just to eat, to get to know them before we would even offer them a, uh, a petition. So I, I think in the long run, the guarding the West Gate is the answer to making Freemasonry what we say we truly are. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Brown. So, John, I'm not going to ask you the magic wand question. Good. But I am going to ask you the crystal ball question. <laughs> Just made it up. If, what is what does Freemasonry look like after the pandemic in your head? I know we don't know, but and I know it will be some way for some lodges and a different way for others. But what does the crystal ball in your mind look like with post pandemic Freemasonry? I, I don't. I don't have that crystal ball, Brian, but. Uh... I think we might want to go fast forward past what it looks like immediately following the pandemic, whether it's later this year or next year, 2022. Let's consider what's going to happen a little further into the future when our membership level falls to pre-Civil War levels. And what that means is when that happens, brothers, uh, Grand Lodge assessments drop significantly. Grand Lodges don't have the budgets and how is that going to affect Freemasonry? And how is our perspective of what we do as Freemasons going to change? There's, there's supposed to be roughly, if we agree with the MSA numbers, which is really the only central source we, we have because there is no other repository to report numbers of members, uh, that there's a million, 71,000, something like that in this country. We're card carrying members. What happens when that drops down to about 300,000? And this steady decline over the last 61 years, we won't get into all that may have caused that, but that steady decline isn't stopping and it continues. And we'll go back to the pandemic. You know, one day we'll probably see Mason sitting around saying, well, boy, if that pandemic hadn't happened, we'd still have a lot of people in Masonry. No, we wouldn't. That, that's not the case. The depression didn't wipe out Masonry. Um, World wars haven't wiped out masonry. Even the Morgan affair in the anti-Masonic era of the 1800s didn't wipe out masonry, reduced it significantly, but didn't wipe it out. And uh, the 60s, what happened there, losing the Vietnam generation, et cetera, um, that isn't really why we lost members. And neither will be the pandemic. We're losing members because we're losing members and age is an issue and we're not replacing them as fast as we thought would happen in the mindset that we had 30, 40, and 50 years ago. So I think the big issue is let's look way past this pandemic. Whatever happens after this is just gonna happen. But let's look way past the pandemic at the biggest, bigger problem is that as we get smaller, there's no choice but to think to be modified, changed, and adjusted in, our, in American Freemasonry. And that may not be all that bad, brothers. Two more questions, and then I'm going to ask you to talk about an upcoming book or two that you have, and then we'll move into the moment of reflection. <clears throat> what advice would you give to men who are interested in exploring or becoming Freemasons? Uh, search carefully for the lodge you want to belong to. Find men in that lodge who are just as interested in learning about Freemasonry as you are. Be patient. Don't jump into it be committed and do it at a time in your life when you can commit some time to it. 
to find men in whatever lodge you're looking for who seem to have the enthusiasm and the zeal and the passion for just what you're searching for as well. Great, thank you. And last question, John, you've touched a lot of people in Freemasonry. You've written a lot of books, read by thousands of people, probably tens of thousands, maybe more. What do you, what do you, who do you want to be remembered by when it comes to Freemasonry when you're gone? I hope you're not going anywhere anytime soon. Let's not, let's not make this a sad story. But what do you, what do you hope to, for people to remember you by as a Freemason? I'm never going to ask that question, but I guess off the top of my head without a great deal of thought, just to be remembered that I gave it everything I had. John, I love you. Thank you, brother. All right, back at you. <clears throat> All right, so you have a couple books upcoming. Uh, would you want to talk about that, or where's your brother Kimball? Or well, there's two actually. There's one called The Age of Unreason, and that is about the uh, anti Masonic period and the Morgan affair. And it's it's a different slant. Um, this book is not about just another rehash of what we're popular popularly told what happened. It has examined from every angle what actually happened and the nonsense that swirled around from both sides, Masons and anti-Masons, and how we not only were damaged by that, and it altered the face of Freemasonry in the 1840s, by the 1840s, but Masonry pretty much shot itself in the foot as well as in the way they handled it. And the true story about that needs to be told. And we need to take accountability for the fact that it wasn't handled very well by either side. And let's just put that in perspective and move on. But that'll, that'll come out sometime later this year. And there's another one that uh, I'll defer to um, forceful brother, Dan Kimball, who I still see is on the screen down there, who is co-authoring uh, this book uh, called Candle in the Dark. Um, Dan, you want to elaborate on what that one's about? Worshipful Brother John, uh, Worshipful Brother Brian, thank you for um, the opportunity to talk about uh, 21st century conversations about Freemasonry. Uh, that is inspired uh, uh, to a great degree by the Zoom meetings we've had and perhaps especially by the Zoom meetings that have been sponsored by Lexington Lodge One. Uh, it is uh, an analysis uh, of the practices of contemporary American Freemasonry measured against uh, its age of enlightenment foundational principles. And uh, it, it has been a, an interesting uh, process to uh, uh, work with Brother John in compiling uh, that particular, uh, that particular uh, manuscript. And uh, when we talk about the age of enlightenment and the age of reason and how that formed the foundational principles of Freemasonry, there is, uh, I think, perhaps a tendency to become hypercritical about where we have moved in, in relationship to those principles. The intention of this particular manuscript is not to bash Freemasonry. It's, it's not to be uh, incredibly critical of Freemasonry, but it's just as Brother John said many times tonight, it's some straight talk about the condition of 21st century American Freemasonry and where we are relative to our foundational principles. Worshipful Brother John, if you want to add anything to that, please feel free. I think you've covered the whole thing there, Dan. Uh, that too should be released, Brian, sometime later on this year. Great. Can't wait to read it. Thank you all. Worshipful Brother Bizak, I know you've, you've had a tough night in the hot seat. You've done an outstanding job. I'm nervous for when and if it's my turn. Um, would you please bring us back to reality and, and lead us in a preamble to the moment of reflection? Certainly. Brothers, those of you who have attended our previous education series meetings know we've designed these meetings along the lines and somewhat like the structure of our state of communications. Now, we all realize that stated meetings cannot be replicated in this format, but that doesn't prevent us either from devoting a few minutes of reflection as we do in our regular meetings. 
and take an opportunity to silently reflect on those things about which we are grateful. Some things we've talked about tonight, like our determination to not simply be made members of our fraternity, but to become Freemasons. We've been selecting music for this education series. That's a little different than what the music is we use in our state of communications. The music selected uh, tonight cannot be dated prior to 1696, but we know it was written by German Baroque composer, Johann Pachelbel. And it's a piece that's risen in popularity to become one of the best known pieces of classical music ever written. So tonight, during our moment of reflection, we'll hear canon in D major, and it'll be played on a classical guitar very quietly. The flowing eight bars of this music is repeated 28 times in the original masterpiece. And tonight we'll only hear about two minutes of this classical piece. And it's the same one has been admired by multiple generations for this unique sense of serenity that it projects, along with this joyful, uplifting character of its repeated melody. So as we listen to this brief rendition, brothers, may you experience what is meant in our lectures about how music and not only soften the heart, but affect our passions. Brothers and friends, next week's presentation is on Monday, July 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our presenter for this evening will be Worship Brother Thomas W. Jackson. And you got just a glimpse of his wisdom and expertise this evening. We hope you will join us. His topic will be Freemasonry, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As a friendly reminder, you do not need to RSVP again. However, you're welcome to do so. You're already on our RSVP list, and I will send out the meeting conference link and login information to our meeting, probably around Tuesday or Wednesday, as well as Monday morning. Please note that the meeting link will be different. If you try to log in using an old link, you will not be able to join the meeting. At this time, I would like to offer the floor to anyone for any comments from Lexington Lodge number one or Rubicon. Good 
Jack, 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 do you have any final comments this evening? Just to thank the brothers at Lexington Lodge One, you particularly, Ryan, and the wardens for the efforts put forth to put this together for the past nine weeks. Excellent job. Uh, continued health, brothers. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Brother. Brothers and friends, at this time, I'd like for us all to take a brief moment of silence to show our love and respect to any absent or sick and distressed brothers, family, or friends that may be going through a challenging time in their lives at this time. Brothers, let us always remember to offer that lending hand and be generous in our services to others in need. Brother Bob Heater, Chaplain of Lexington Lodge Number 1, will you please deliver the closing devotion? Worshipful, let us pray and give thanks to our eternal God, the grand architect and builder of the universe, the maker of all things, judge of all men, he who grants every good and perfect gift. Having been blessed by your guiding presence during our study time together this evening, we now offer to you the results of what we have done. May we be guided and strengthened for our, our Masonic commitments. We again thank you for giving to us as observant Masons the principles of Freemasonry and that we are part of your work through the craft. May the grand architect of the universe always be our guide. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chapman. Brother Junior Warden Don Combs of Lexington Laws Number One, will you please deliver the closing charge? Merciful Mass. Friend brother, we are now about to disagree. Friendship and friendship to mix against the world. And this concern employment for not the duty of her is frequently invaded and forced recommend its meeting. Be diligent, prudent, temperate, and discreet. Remember that it is good to befriend and relieve others you deem worthy and who shall need your assistance. Let the world observe how two friends and brothers love one another. These generous principles are to extend further. Every human being has a claim upon your kind office. Do good will, break more respect unto the whole of the fool. By distance, duties of respective cause, liberal relevance, and diffuse charity. Constancy and fidelity or friendship. Discover the official and be effect this ancient and honor institution. Let it be posed that of labor to vain, spring to venture string not, for your truth is with the and your pains with God. Finally, friends and brethren, be ye all of mine in peace, and may the good love and peace light to do with and you. Thank you, Brother Junior Warden. I want to personally thank everyone who attended and participated this evening, and a very special thanks to Worship Brother Bizak. If anyone wishes to invite other brothers to future meetings or men you know personally who have expressed an interest in Freemasonry and you feel that they are of like mind with us, please ask them to RSVP at LexingtonLodge1.org. I want to thank everyone again for your attendance, your commitment to your brothers, your commitment to your lodges, and your commitment to Freemasonry. May we always be happy to meet, sorry to part, and happy to meet again. You are dismissed with my many thanks and very warm fraternal regards. See everyone next Monday. Have a great night.